Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM and SASL are jointly exploring options to anchor domestic gas demand as South Africa faces a sharp decline in gas supply from Mozambique. Terence Kremer joins me to discuss the move. Terence, what is the background to this memorandum of understanding between ESCOM and SASL? Well, the big background is a, a big cliff that's coming from a gas supply perspective. So it was supposed to be mid-2026. That was the indication that Sassel put into the market a few years ago and caused a lot of anxiety. And uh, it's now extended that plateau of supply from southern Mozambique through drilling uh, to mid-2027. But that's just a sort of a year's grace. And there is a bit more activity in that part of the world and there could be an extension potentially to 2028. So it's given some breathing room, but not much. We know these are long gestation assets to build a, a, liquid fire, a liquefied natural gas terminal, which would be in Matola, Mozambique, most likely, to, so as to use the uh, Romco pipeline into South Africa. is going to take many years to get to financial close and then to actually build and then start operating. So the, the, the time is not on our side in terms of that supply. And there's this pent up demand in South Africa, mostly from industrial users that use the gas in the industrial processes. What are some of the options being explored? So the option under the Sassel Eskim MOU is it's not 100% clear what they're going to be looking at. One thing is clear is that it's uh, gas to power, whether that, uh, that can create demand, f enough demand for the molecules beyond the domestic demand um, in, in South Africa, that's around 120, 180 petajoules a year, to take that to a bit of a higher level to make uh, LNG import terminal make commercial sense. So the vo it's a volume game. The higher the, the demand profile in South Africa, the lower the ultimate cost of that molecule coming into South Africa. Already there's going to be a step change for industrial users moving from gas that's coming in from um, uh, Mozambique through a pipeline, it's going to be a step change once we start importing that gas from global sources. Qatar was mentioned, but there could be other sources of that supply. But to whether it's feasible then to uh, have uh, gas to power, one, at that price, but if we don't have gas to power, what, what will the price be? What will that step change be? So if you have a higher level of demand, can we reduce that? So it looks like a, a gas to power type discussion that Sassel and Eskim are going to enter into, particularly in proximity to the existing pipeline. So we're not really talking about Richards Bay here and a, a, um, a LNG terminal there. It's about can we use the existing pipeline infrastructure into South Africa and along that pipeline are there gas to power opportunities. And what we do know is that a number of the retiring coal-fired power stations, now Eskim's got a bit of relief around that. So instead of retiring some of those units as they should be being retired now, they've got relief until 2030. So again, there's some breathing space. But can some of that capacity be converted from coal to gas within proximity to that pipeline, then create additional demand for gas in South Africa, and in doing so, bring, uh, bring overall the cost of the gas molecule uh, being imported into Mozambique down for South Africa. What are some of the um, potential risks to this development? Well, I think the big risk for South Africa is from a consumer perspective. You know, what is the price of electricity going to be if we're going to be producing electricity on uh, using imported liquefied natural gas? We already know for the use of industrial gas, this is, a, as I mentioned earlier, a major step change. And we're doing this with a mix mentality. So. We want an energy mix and uh, we, can, we know we've got a dull coal dominant system. We're moving to what uh, the government says would be a mix of different technology, including variable renewable energy that requires complementary technologies, potentially gas to power, to close the gaps when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. So we, are, we have this mix mentality, but we don't have a globular vision of what is the most optimal electricity and energy mix for South Africa. We, we've never had an integrated energy plan. And so it's potential here for very suboptimal type decisions from a cost perspective. How much gas to power do we really need in South Africa? 
as we transition to a variable renewable-led system, will that gas to power be more competitive versus the new technologies that are emerging? We know we've already got pumped hydro, which is embedded in our system, which is very useful to balance a renewable-led system. And we know that battery energy storage is coming down massively. And we have already a massive installed fleet of battery energy storage. You know, because of the load shedding crisis, people didn't just put solar panels on their roof. They also put a battery in the house. So we have a really massive uh, installed base of battery energy storage in South Africa that isn't used optimally. But we are moving into a new world where battery energy storage is going to be part of the mix, is going to be cost competitive increasingly. So without this bigger picture of one, the electricity system and how it's going to work into the future, and two, the energy system and how the services that used to be provided through fossil fuels are going to be supplied increasingly through electricity that is produced by wind and solar. How that's all going to fit together, we don't have that vision. We just got this fig leaf, as I'd like to call it, of uh, mix. And behind that fig leaf, many suboptimal decisions can happen. So yes, it looks like an important thing to try and close this or deal with this gas cliff, and it is important to deal with this gas cliff, but we could make decisions here that will have us as consumers and as industry paying the cost for many, many years to come. Terence, thank you very much. That's the Second Take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily Email Newsletter.